Three. After learning she would lose her physician at the Eagle Creek Medical Clinic, and she quickly realized she wasn't alone. We are ready and willing to listen and meet at any time to talk about the tangible now solutions that the citizens and our organization deserve and need to see. Okay, you heard the voice there of Camille Curry. She joins me now, founder and organizer of BC Healthcare Matters. Camille, thanks a lot for coming on today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Okay, congratulations on your success so far in, in highlighting this issue. I, I think you've done a, a really good job of it. We saw a big turnout at a rally at the BC Legislature. I've seen a lot of your lawn signs around as well. Can you tell us a bit about this this campaign, the petition drive you have going, and, and why you started this? Yeah, so um, as you said, we did just have our rally on May 19th, and I think that was an absolute fabulous success. Um, it really brought out a lot of citizens and medical professionals from all over the island, but as well as from the mainland. Um, and it really gave people an opportunity to, you know, gather together and share their stories and also share their frustration. And for me personally, it was actually a really emotional um, kind of event because it was really great to see so many people come out, but it was also incredibly sad to have to see so many people come out to support um, our need for addressing this crisis. Um, my family was uh, first thrown kind of into this because as uh, the recording just suggested, we lost our family doctor back at the end of January. Um, and our family has complex medical needs. And so I started looking into what our options would be, how we'd be able to provide the care, uh, pardon me, get the care that my family needs. And it didn't take very long before it became very apparent that there was little to no choices for us. Um, and so I just decided I, I couldn't sit by and just, you know, watch this happen and just complain. And I am a, you know, mover person. And so I said, enough is enough. And so I started yeah. BC Healthcare Matters to basically, as you suggested, right, kind of activate the citizens and gather together the people that are being affected by this so that we can express that this isn't okay and we're not going to stand by idle and watch this happen. And for us to develop a group, which we've done, that is transformed into an amazing group of people to basically keep, you know, proposing calls to action for us to get involved in so that everybody can have a voice in this. Yeah, can you can you expand a little bit about you know what it's like when you've got a family, you've got family members, you got some complex health care challenges for like for people who are in the happy position of having good health, and maybe you just need to go to a walk in clinic occasionally, get a prescription or whatever. Maybe yeah. this is not such a big problem, but when you have some complex care challenges, that's when a family doctor can really help. Correct. Yeah, it's true. Um, you know, in my 20s, I was incredibly healthy, never would have thought I have any health conditions or problems. And then my 30s hit and I personally developed a numerous um, health problems. And I do have two young children that have had quite a few health problems since a young age. But, um, you know, one of the things that stands out to me, because when I do think of these other individuals that may not understand the importance of the family doctor is that you just don't know what you don't know. So for a long time, I didn't know what was wrong with my children. I didn't know why they were so sick so often. And it was because of having a family doctor that we were able to piece that together and figure out what was going on with them and how we were going to help them and how we were going to treat them. So I think it's really important for people out there that, you know, maybe aren't facing health struggles right now themselves to just remember, though, that you never know when you might. And also, if you have, if you are fortunate enough to have a family doctor, I really want everyone out there with a family doctor to know right now that that is not a guarantee. You need to think about how long is your family doctor going to stick around in this system crumbling the way it is. Yeah, speaking to Camille Curry, founder of BC Healthcare Matters, what has their response to the campaign been like so far? Like, I know you've got this online petition drive going, right? How many signatures have you collected on the petition so far? Yeah, so we actually got it tabled on Thursday, and it was up to 42,000 signatures. Wow. Um, yeah, so it's a large volume of individuals, and it's great to see that because, again, it just shows that there's lots of people out there that are willing to speak up and to um, sign on with the endeavors that we're getting onto here. So like you mentioned before, we've got the lawn signs going out, which are great. They're an amazing yeah. way to be able to um, just share our group's, our group's goals and who we are. 
And then also we're starting to put together more citizen activism opportunities that will come up. And we want to do it in all the cities because this is a province-wide crisis. And so while I live in Victoria and much of the government is here, we definitely are continuing to look to expand our team outside of this so that we can get everybody in the province involved because we all deserve better from the system. Mm -hmm. Speaking of the government, have you been able to get a meeting with anyone from government? And what are they saying to you? No, we haven't at this time, not with the NDP. We have had meetings with MLAs from the other parties, and um, it was Liberal health critic Shirley Bond that tabled our petition for us. But unfortunately, the NDP has not come forward with um, anybody willing to speak with us at this time, and we would really love to because we think just as important as it is for them to be sitting down and doing negotiations with the doctors' associations, it's important for them to sit down and to hear what we as a citizen group have to say as well because It's our taxpayer money, and this is our health care and our health that we're talking about. Yeah. Why do you, how do we think, how do you think we got into this position? Like, I've just been checking out your website here this morning, and there's a lot of good background on there. Like, for people who are wondering how we got into this situation, how did we get to this point, do you think? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, so it's definitely something that's been coming on for a long time. You know, one of the saddest things is, is that when you go to look up, um, if you even just put in BC family doctor crisis, you'll find news reports from 10 years ago even. And so this has been coming for quite a while. But yeah. I think the most, you know, kind of poignant things that have happened in the last, say, five years is that um, there's been a mass redistribution of our health care funds. And a lot of that has gone into these urgent primary care centers. And so the government decided in 2017 that it was going to be their initiative to um, transform the health care system. And I think the problem is, is that right now, you know, five years later, we're looking at the system and we're not seeing the transform transformational changes that they had promised. And we're just seeing a lot of our health care money being used in areas that are not providing um, tangible benefits to the citizens. So, you know, when people are concerned about, well, the doctors are out there saying that they need more money and we don't have more money to give. Well, I would suggest that, you know, it's important for us to hold our government accountable and demand more transparency and for us to take a look and see what are these urgent primary care budgets, how much are they costing, and is this the appropriate use of our health care ministry funds right now? Um, The other thing I think that people don't realize is the effects that this is having on every layer of our health care system. So while it may seem like a daunting task to consider paying family doctors any more than they currently receive, I think people need to also consider that no matter what, that child that has strep throat, if they can't get in to see a family doctor today, their mother is going to take them down to the ER. And that ER visit is going to cost, you know, 500 to to $1,000 of taxpayers' money. So there are a lot of ways that if we made the appropriate um, uh, corrections and put the money back into our community family physicians that we could lower the costs to us, the taxpayers, and basically just do some redistribution. So I think that, um, you know, I'm glad the government says that they're in talks with associations and with the gov- uh, docs of BC, but I don't think all the changes are going to come from the physician's master agreement either. Um, yeah. the, doc- the doctors need more money, that's for sure. It's been made clear by themselves and their associations, and I fully support that. Um, but we will also need the government to think a little further outside the box. <clears throat> yeah, what, like what kind of changes would you like to see? Like I spoke earlier on the show today to a family doctor who's with another group that's pretty much aligned with what you're saying, and and he was describing how doctors, family doctors, will get paid the same whether they see someone for 30 seconds or 30 minutes. So sometimes people will come in and just want a prescription renewed, which is quick and easy in many cases. But then other times people will come in with the present with a complex situation or a number of problems. And exactly. Yeah. So do you think that he was suggesting, well, maybe they should be paid on a, a per time basis and not necessarily on a per patient visit pace basis? What do you think? Yeah. 
I think that it makes full sense to me. I think that um, to suggest that one fee and one dollar amount will suit every citizen's need um, is basically ludicrous, frankly. And if we look at other provinces within our country, they do do it in other ways. And they do provide, as that physician suggested, things that are called like time modifiers that allow them to bill for that extra 15 minutes that they needed to spend with that senior who perhaps had multiple issues that day or who just needed things explained in a little bit different way that took more time. So I don't think that it's unreasonable. They're not asking for something that doesn't already exist. That type of pay model already exists within our country. So I think it's time for us to get on board with not reinventing and instead let's do some replicating of the successes across Canada. Um, huh. These doctors are definitely asking for basically just equitable pay with the other career paths that they have the option to choose, right? Okay. So we don't we don't want to keep losing them all to hospitalist positions. All right, welcome back, my guest Camille Curry, founder of BC Healthcare Matters. Let's go to the phone lines. Lena in Surrey. Hi, Lena. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, yeah, no, I've, I'm a nurse, so that's my background, and I have to be really honest, I've always been very uh, perturbed as to why we're not utilizing nurse practitioners more in British Columbia, especially amidst this crisis. Um, the, the things that nurses can do that are certified to order simple tests and that can um, prescribe simple medications uh, would have a, such a huge and profound uh, ability to take some of the pressure off of the system, and yet... We're still waiting for, for nurses to be used at full scope in that way, particularly the nurse practitioners, because, of course, they're more of an advanced care um, and, and they have advanced uh, uh, knowledge and, and, and skills and certifications. Um, but it, it, really, it really puzzles me that we're not seeing more of that happen. I remember going into walk-in clinics with my children and um, being able to go in there and tell a doctor, oh, yeah, this, this, my baby has pneumonia, I can, I can hear it, because I, I had the assessment skills. I was able to do that. Um, and here we had this doctor now that had to kind of replicate what I, as a nurse, was already able to do. Um, it was just really, it, it, it just was mind-blowing. And, okay. and so no wonder our family physicians are overwhelmed and have gone to walk-in clinics where they can do a quick assessment get billed and, to, and charge for it and, and, and move on. I think that we need to really look at the way that the system is set up to begin with, develop okay, a better thank partnership you. between nurses and physicians. Alina, thank you for that call. Camille, what do you think of that? Um, I definitely think that nurse practitioners have a very key role to play in our system. Um, and as we've seen, basically, they've been the uh, kind of heartthrob of a lot of the urgent and primary care centers because they're unable to find doctors to staff in there. And so many of them are nurse practitioners and RNs that are running the urgent primary care centers. I think, as the caller suggested, though, that to be able to use them perhaps to their full capacity and their full skill set will require having to reconfigure the way that private that practices um, are funded and the way that they oh. are run. And so right now, unfortunately, that isn't something that I think we can do because we need to address the crisis right now. But I fully agree that there is a place for them, and I'm sure they can definitely help the system um, move a little bit more effectively and be able to uh, see more patients. But I don't think that our system is set up right now to be able to make them an integral part because they can't set up their own private practices. There are a couple across the province, I think two of them. Um, but again, to do that isn't going to help the 1 million patients right now. And right now, yeah. BC Healthcare's matter goal is how can we get the most possible um, action for what we need to address the 1 million people that don't have the family doctor right now? <clears throat> Go to Devinder on the line in Vancouver. Hi, Devinder. Hi. Um, May 4th, 2022, CTV did a story about 600 Alberta starting new patients. How is it possible the province right next door where they can pay their doctors more, they can have doctors accept patients, and here in BC, the same amount of money, same 75-25% split that the feds pay and the BC pays, how is that possible? Okay, okay Camille, are, are, yeah. are other provinces doing it better? Is that true? 
Oh, they, they absolutely are. And again, yeah. let's not put Alberta up on a pedestal or anything, but in comparison to us right now, they definitely have this model down a lot better than us. And as the caller suggested, I've done the research myself. The health ministry budgets per capita are nearly exactly equal between BC and Alberta. We received the nearly same per capita transfer funds. So I have the same question as him as well. Why is it that Alberta can do so much better with theirs? They're paying their doctors more. They're paying their doctors time modifiers. They actually have team-based care set up. They have functional primary care networks. And as he suggested, there are hundreds and hundreds of doctors that are willing to take patients right now. They are nowhere near facing the crisis that we are, and yet we have the same type of funding model. So while we may have a different um, patient base, and there there is data to support that, that we have a more slightly senior population here, there's no way that's the explanation for what's happening. And so the biggest thing that stands out to me that is the difference between BC and Alberta is our urgent primary care centers and how much funding that we have funneled towards that over the last seven years.